I'm gonna keep it 100% real. How the hell do you sell a young, black, dark-skinned female that's just rapping, not cursing, positive mess? Like, I didn't think un people understood it. I didn't think they would get it. My name is Datavio Samuels, and welcome to The Black Print, where I sit with the innovators, disruptors, and change makers. My guests open up about every step of their journey and share lessons learned along the way to provide creators, entrepreneurs, and executives with a tangible blueprint for navigating to the top of their industry. This is The Black Print. Welcome, welcome, welcome to The Black Print. Here we start every show out the same way with my favorite quote. Everybody sees you on the mountaintop. Not everybody sees you on the climb. Mm. This is the show where we talk to the ceiling breakers, the disruptors, the innovators about their climb to the top. And today I'm so thrilled to have this wonderful, beautiful queen next to me. You guys know what we do here at Revolt. We don't believe that we should be telling other people's story. We believe that people should control their own narrative and own their own narrative. And so I will kick it to you and ask you to please introduce yourself to the audience. Yes, okay. I would love to do that. My name is Flage Johnson. I am an artist, athlete, entrepreneur, soon to be mogul, daughter, sister, and you know, a protector, like that's who I am. I love that. I heard that soon to be mogul in there. Yes, hey, I speaking it into existence. Gotta climbing. add that in there. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I see you. All right, so we're gonna go, now that we know who you are today, we're mm -hmm. gonna take it all the way back to the beginning. Yes. Tell us a little bit about what life was like for Flage growing up. Um, life like was, what was your childhood like? My childhood, my childhood was beautiful. Life okay. was amazing, I can't lie. You know, although I, feel, I always felt like I had, you know, I was just always behind because mm -hmm. growing up, you know, I never met my father, right? He died before I was born. So I always like to say that my story started before I was born. So mm -hmm. in that, in that, in that aspect, you know, my, my story started May 19th, 2003. That was the day my father was killed. And, you know, my mom carried me, right? She was telling me all these stories about how she wasn't eating during her pregnancy. She was so sad, like, and, and, you know, she had me and just, she told me like, it was like the greatest day ever. And, as I, as I grew up, you know, she treated me like a queen, like, you know, and my mom, she's like superwoman. And she always felt like she had to like overcompensate, mm -hmm. right? Because my father wasn't, you know, alive, but she was enough, mm -hmm. you know, what she provided was enough. Just me, her and my brother was always enough. And, and so I grew up, I had an amazing childhood. Like I, wa I watched my mom hustle, you know, everything wasn't always, you know, you know, rainbows, but, it, it was always a blessing and beautiful, mm -hmm. you know? We always had a, a roof over our head. I was able to be outside. Like, my childhood was great. I don't, <laughs> these kids today, I feel bad for them because I, I, mean, I used to be outside, I used to be riding my bikes, just riding through the city. I was in a little rap group when I was okay. like seven. Like, you know, I had a great childhood. Um, and, you know, in my city in Savannah, everybody knew my father. Mm -hmm. So I kind of was like royalty down there, okay. right? So I kind of <laughs> ran the city from a young age and I've always just had like a little bit of name attached to, you know, me, so. I mean, growing up was amazing. Mm -hmm. I just love to be with my grandparents. I love to be outside, like to play basketball, be with the guys. Like I was definitely a tomboy for sure. Um, but yeah, like my mom, she put me and my brother in private school and we moved to Atlanta. And you know, my life changed from there. Mm -hmm. I love the juxtaposition. So you, you talk about how, um, your, your origin story starts in pain. Yeah. My father was murdered. But yeah. then on the flip side, your framing is my childhood was beautiful, right? Yes. How did you take what could have been all pain yeah. and turn it into beauty? How did you take what could have been all pain yeah. and turn it into purpose? Yes. No, I like to say, you know, turn your tragedy into triumph. Absolutely. Right? And I've heard, and when, once I heard that, let me tell you, okay, I'm gonna be real transparent. So that's all we want. Absolutely. When I was younger, I was bad. <laughs> like I was, I, 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 I was a bad kid. Like I was so hurt, right? I was so hurt when I was a kid. I'm like, why is my dad not here, right? And I started lashing out. I started lashing out so bad, and it wasn't to the point where I was like a disrespectful kid, but it was like I didn't know where to place my anger, mm. right? And you know, I just needed an outlet and I needed a resource. And what saved me was the Boys and Girls Club, Frank Callen Boys and Girls Club. That's why you know I try to give back to it as much as I can. Um, but 
that, that, that changed my life because I had so many coaches who turned into father figures for me and they never let me feel sorry for myself. Right. And coach Maurice, I have to give a shout out to him. I always looked at him like a father, whether he do it or not, but he never let me feel sorry for myself. He held me accountable. I used to play basketball with the boys growing up. He held me accountable to the highest standard and I kind of found my way. And man, like that, it really changed my life because it just changed my mindset. And I knew, you know, outside of my mom that I had community and people that cared about me and wanted to see me great. And that is like the number one thing that I think kids need. I think they need to see purpose and I think they need to know that they are worthy outside of their family of something that's bigger than them. And that's that's what I got from there. And it really changed my life. Mm -hmm. It really changed my life like because it changed my perspective mm -hmm. as a kid. That's why I think it's so important that I do good and I and I put myself in a positive light to show the kids there's a different way to become successful, mm -hmm. right? And for me, it's like, I know I embody the stereotypical norms of a of a black person in society. You play basketball or you make music, right? <laughs> it's the only way to get out the hood, quote unquote. And so that's why it's so important for me to get my degree mm -hmm. is because I want to show them like, Either lane, either which way, like it doesn't matter what lane you pick, you can be successful, mm -hmm. and that doesn't have to be the normal thing, right? Mm -hmm. and, and and the boys and girls club showed me that, and they just gave me the resources for that. So for those people who are watching, who have experienced tragedy, who yes. have experienced pain, who have experienced loss, yeah. what words of advice would you give them um, in terms of how to turn tragedy into triumph? I think, you know, first you just have to be kind to yourself, right? Because I think we are always in our own head, yeah. right? You got to be kind to yourself and give yourself grace. And, you know, I think it's like a learning thing because it's like me, what I'm learning now, like I have to process things, right? And because I like I love my energy right <laughs> and I don't you know I'm selective about how, who I let into my energy so that's the same thing about like turning that tragedy into tribe you have to feel that bad energy in order to you know make good things out of it. like you have to feel pain to, to be able to create the pleasure from it and I think I learned to do that at such a young age like mm -hmm. my perspective like I keep telling people perspective is everything and I just turn my perspective into my reality mm -hmm. you know I love that like I think you can find two different people who experience the exact same thing and I see it so different. And because of their perspective, one will go one way and 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 be in despair and loss, and yeah. another one will go another way and be completely exactly. successful, right? Exactly. I think it's literally the way that we learn to frame the things that are happening yes. in our lives, right? I, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. I want to go to you know one of the things so you true. said is that you always were kind of in Savannah. You were always royalty. Yeah. Um, that can be heavy. That could be beautiful. Yeah. I don't know what, like, what, what was it like for you to always be royalty from a young age? Yeah, no, it could be a lot, but it was good for me because okay. it prepared me for where I am now, right? I always tell people, like, damn, like, how do you feel? Like, I'm like, y'all, I've been in the spotlight since I was born. Like, it might have not been on this big level, but in some way, in some capacity, I've always been known. And so I feel like what, you know, with having that presence, it's like a privilege. Mm -hmm. It's a privilege for me to be able to, you know, walk in that light. And so I don't take it for granted. And I, I've been like that since I was a kid. I always knew that I was that girl, first of all. I always knew that. My mama instilled that confidence in me when I was yay high. Told me I was beautiful. Told me my skin was beautiful. Told me I was perfect. So I always walk like that. But I always knew. But it was, okay, boom. It was like I always was confident, but I always was humble because it was that piece of me that had to stay humble, I felt like, because it was like... Just like my dad not being there, like it really like, you know, put something else inside of me. I think that humbleness, because it's, I always felt like I was already at a disadvantage, mm -hmm. right? And so, I don't know, it was just like, I was just it's just able to walk into my own light mm -hmm. and hold that. And I just like, some people would take that and be like, take it and be cocky. And I always wanted to take it and turn that into positivity mm -hmm. because I had already felt so much negativity growing up, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, um, for me, I like, I'm very much the same. Like, my goal is to always stay confident, but stay humble. Yes. And like, if you look at it on a spectrum of like zero to 10, let's say zero is humble and 10 is arrogant. For most people, if you're a zero, like super humble, you're 10 steps away from arrogance. Mm. What I realize in my life is like, 
humble and arrogant sit right next to each other. Yep. And so I have to find a way, like I am one step away yep. from arrogant if mm -hmm. I let things get away. How did you manage to find that balance between being confident yeah. but staying humble? Basketball. Mm. Basketball has a way of humbling you. Right, because you don't know what's going to happen when you step out on that court. <laughs> you might come out there and drop 50 or you might brick every shot. You know what I mean? And But I, I, I just... I don't know. I just, I just never, I, I never wanted to be that girl. Like I never cared about being the it girl. Right. I just always cared about being myself. Right. And so it was never like a role that I had to play. It was nothing that I was faking. It was just genuine. And I, and I like, I'm the type of person I just try to like make everybody feel comfortable. Right. Nobody wants to be around a snobbish person. Thanks. Like nobody likes that. Like it's not enjoyable. So I don't know. I just, I've always been a people pleaser, a people person. So I've always knew that I was going to be great from a young age. I knew it. Just knew mm. it. But I wanted to do it in a graceful way. Mm. I always liked elegance. I always liked, you know, to be able to command attention without trying to seek attention. Like, you know, I always wanted to be that person. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Okay, so you're growing up in Boys and Girls Club. You're playing basketball. So that's clearly how you're building that craft. Yes. Let's get into the rap side. How did you start to build your, your craft as it re relates to becoming uh, a superstar rapper? Yeah, no, that started... When I was seven years old, I remember I was in the basement with my uncle and this is when we still had CDs and we were just going through CDs and he was playing it and he was like, bro, like, you know, your daddy was crazy. Like, he the one that really got me into it. He was like, you can do it too. I was like, bro, I don't know how to rap. He was like, man, you can rap. Your daddy was a rapper. So I was like, all right, write me a rap. I'm going to rap it for my mama. Man, I wrapped it for my mama. She said, uh-uh, absolutely not, right? She like, you're seven years old. You're going to go to school. You're going to be smart. You're going to go to college. You're gonna, you know what I'm saying? Like, she already had my life lined up, okay. right? And my uncle was like, just let her do it. Like, she just want to do it. And my mom, she threw these annual birthdays for my father where they would just celebrate his life on his birthday. I said, mom, let me perform. It's crazy. And it was at a club, right? I'm seven years old, a like seven, probably club. eight, probably eight, okay. nine, probably, probably. But that was my first performance ever. And I'm just like this on the stage. I got to show you the video. We just found it. But yeah. it, 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 it was it was beautiful. It was it, it was something that I knew that I wanted to do. Like you ever feel like, OK, this is what I'm supposed to be doing right now. This is my call. And somebody telling me it was that. And, you know, I just like to think that it's in my blood. Like, mm -hmm. it's just something I'm supposed to do. Like, when I first started rapping, it was like, I got to submit my father's legacy. Like, you know, mm -hmm. they tried to kill him and in his name, and I just wanted to live forever. So that was always my passion, even when starting music. Even when I wasn't good at all, that was my goal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So your uncle was helping you rap, like yeah. helping you learn. Yeah. Were there like favorite artists that you were looking at their craft and trying to steal and borrow from yeah. some of who were the two or some of those? It artists? was just my dad. You know what I mean? It was just my dad. He I think he had like three albums out and I would just blast them because you got to think like I have nothing of my dad. Like I have nothing. I don't have a piece of clothing. I don't have a. I have, I have one piece of clothing. Okay. I don't have a chain. I don't have anything that. So that was the only way I felt like we could connect was through music. And so I just dug into that. And that's that's literally people always ask me like, how do you think of these flows? How do you think of these? Cadence? Like I just go listen to my dad music and I pull out what I want. Like oh, that's beautiful. my daddy music. I'm gonna take it. Like you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And it just becomes something of my own, right? Because our content is totally different. Like he talked about what he grew up in streets poverty gang lifestyle i don't live that mm -hmm. i haven't lived that i can't talk about that but what i can talk about is my perspective and my motivation and my ambition for what i do do so i try to just you know make that seamlessly come together in music and it just always does you know it's just it's a blessing from god where it's not me it's not me yeah i love it i lost my father in 2020 mm. and um i always tell this story that uh before I lost him, I didn't realize that we were on similar paths. Mm -hmm. And then when I sat in his funeral and heard people talk, talk about, about him, him, right? So I knew him from the eyes of a young kid, yeah. right? Hearing adults talk about my father, it was so easy for me to see that what he was doing and what I was doing was so similar, right? He was a professor and he was going into very white spaces, but championing and fighting for mm -hmm. black culture and black people. 
and I was able to draw a direct line between what he was doing and what I was doing on the media side yeah. and on the creative side. And so that has become my fuel. Mm -hmm. um, just the idea that I can continue to um, carry out his legacy. What does it feel like to be able to uh, be the one who is carrying out your father's legacy in the way that you are now? It's beautiful. I wouldn't want anybody else to tell his story but me and my family and my mom, right? And I, I just love it because they, you know, when they killed my father, like, I feel like it was jealousy, but it was like something that was deep rooted in hate. Like, my dad was murdered in broad daylight, mm -hmm. the middle of the day, with a baby in his hand. People would think it's my brother, but it wasn't. It was just, it was a child he was with, but with a baby in his hand, like, you know what I mean? So that, that, like, that's like monster activity for me, right? And so for me, the carrying out his legacy is the only thing, mm -hmm. right? And when you have something that's the only thing that you think of and it's the only thing that you want to do, it just gives you, like you said, that extra fuel. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, and just hearing people talk about my father, like, you know, he was just so kind and he was full of life and all this. I'm like, that's me. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so it's like, you know, fulfilling that legacy has just meant everything to me. And my mom told me the other day, she was like, you know, like, Flaja, like, you've, you've done it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're doing it, but you've done it like you are bigger than your dad, right? And when she said that to me, it's kind of like stopped me in my tracks. I was kind of like, no, I'm not. Like, you know, I would never look at myself as, like, I think he's the biggest ever. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I, I can never reach that. She was like, call it what you want, but you have, like, you know what I'm saying? And it's just like, it's a blessing because that's all I ever wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, I get a chance to now build my own legacy and something for my kids to leave behind. So, I'm, you know, to follow, so. It's beautiful. Yeah, it is it's beautiful. beautiful. So you're studying your father's uh, style. Yeah. You're building it into your own. When is the first time? I know that you, you said, you know, you had success in the club at seven, eight years old <laughs> at that celebration. But when is the first time where you feel like you get a real win publicly um, as it relates to your rap career? A real win publicly was when I was on America's Got Talent. Okay. Because I got the golden buzzer. I told my dad's story and went crazy. Mm -hmm. My real win privately. The biggest win that I had in my life was a loss, which is crazy, right? Was on a was on a rap game with Jermaine Dupri, right? The kids show we all competed in I the love house. That show, yeah, it was amazing. It was one of the biggest shows ever. Shout out to JD. We need to recreate that. But one of the biggest shows ever, right? And I and I didn't win. Right, and I was 12 years old and I was walking out of that studio and I was so hurt. You know, like you're 12 years old, you feel like this your dream, you feel like you're just close and they just slam the door on your face until you try again next time. That loss was the best thing that ever could have happened to me because I took everything to heart and I took it so serious. I locked myself up in a room for about like two months and I was just writing. I was writing music every day. I filled up pads and pads and pads. All I would do was write, 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 write. Just write, just that's all I did. And then, then in like three months, America's Got Talent call. Mm, how did they discover you? From the rap game, mm -hmm. right? And you know, I thought, my, I thought it was over. I'm like, this is the only shot I would get. Like, you know what I'm saying? I thought it was, but that loss, made me go into preparation mode and to where like I was going crazy trying to figure out how to be better, right? That's why I always tell people like, it's never a loss, it's always a lesson. Because if I didn't take that loss and I didn't go in there and write a million songs, I would have never been prepared for America's Got Talent, right? So, you know, I, that's why I always say my biggest, my biggest win was a loss because that loss changed my life taught me how to work hard. I had already had a work ethic in basketball, but it wasn't the same in music because I was just being careless with it, honestly. I was like, I know I'm good. Like, because I was good. Like, I, I knew I was naturally gifted. Okay, so I love how you dropped this gem, this line about how your biggest loss was your biggest lesson. Mm -hmm. But another thing that you kind of snuck in there was that you got the golden buzzer on America's Got Talent. Yeah. Like a handful of people get that every year. Yeah. Do you remember what that felt like? Do you remember those emotions? Man, that felt like, that literally felt like my dad just giving me the baton, right? And just was like, go. Mm -hmm. That's what that was. And it was crazy because me and my stepdad, 
We actually used to watch America's Got Talent, just watch the reruns, watch the story. We used to cry and watch the golden buzzer. Mm -hmm. And when I went and auditioned, I did the tribute to my father, right? It was called Guns Down. It had got like 60 million views. It went super crazy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, well, on social media. And I was like, damn, I thought that was my golden buzzer thing. Like, that was it. Like, you know what I'm saying, right? And, you know, Simon came to the back after my performance. was like, you're going to be a superstar. Like, oh, you got that Simon cosign. <laughs> I was 14. Yeah. I went back to school. I told my teacher, ah, oh, baby, you, I just talked to Simon. He, he, we got totally different plans, right? <laughs> and so I had that cosign when I was 14, but they had already given away all their golden buzzers, right? So they told me that, and it was like, damn, like, like, cause I was like one of the latest editions. But another round they do is judge cuts. A celebrity judge comes and they get one golden buzzer. Oh. Chris Hardwick gave it to me. He was so touched. I was overcome with emotions. And when, when the golden buzzer stuff and confetti was falling down on me, it was just like my dad just like, just telling me like, there you go. Like, it's just passion of baton. And in that, in that moment, I felt like everything made sense. It's like, because I didn't know, like, it's like, really, like, I'm going to keep it 100% real. How the hell do you sell a young, black, dark-skinned female that's just rapping, not cursing, positive mess? Like, I didn't think un people understood it. I didn't think they would get it. Mm -hmm. And then when I got that golden buzzer and it was given to me by a man that wasn't black, that probably don't even listen to rap for real. You know what I'm saying? It was like that music transcends through whatever. Like, you know what I'm saying? Music, if you can feel that music, it can work. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I knew that I could actually do it for real, for real. Like, that's when I knew I could captivate people. No matter what color you are, no matter what race, no matter what ethnicity, no matter what age, like... Music brings people together, and it's all I want to do. And so I, once I knew I had that power, man, like, the rest was easy. It's a beautiful story. Uh, what I want to ask you next is, you know, what made you believe that you could be non-conventional? You're talking about I'm a dark-skinned black woman rapping about socially conscious. Like, what made you believe that that was possible and that there would be an audience for it? My mom. Mm -hmm. My mom believed in this whole thing before I believed in it, honestly. She believed in me before I believed in myself. I would tell people, my mom is like the smartest woman I know. She's the strongest woman I know. Um, and I was able to believe that because I just look at my mom like a goddess. Like, I don't know. I just, I, 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 the ground she walks on, I just think it's, I praise it. Yeah. Honestly, because it's all that I had, all I knew. And when your mama believe in you, bro, like nobody got to believe in you. Nobody had, it doesn't matter what anybody in the world say. Once your mom tells you, you believe, she believes in you and that you can do it. Like I knew I could do it because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. my mama told mama me. Mama said so. My mama quit her job when I was on a rap game. She was three, four months pregnant, quit her job. To go be with me on the rap game, not knowing what was going to come about. Like, you know what I'm saying? And I, that's what did like. I had that type of like belief. Mm -hmm. Like she had that type of belief mm -hmm. in me. In you, yeah. So it's like, how can I not believe in myself? And my mama believed me full throttle. So, and I knew that the game needed something different. Like I knew these kids needed somebody to look up to other than what they've been seeing. Mm -hmm. Cause I needed somebody to look mm -hmm. up to, right? And I didn't have it. I'm like, I don't know what I want to be, but I know that ain't it, mm -hmm. you know? And I just like felt like, the world just needed something different. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, I never thought it would be me, right? Like, a young black girl from Savannah, like, like could have been a, a statistic, mm -hmm. honestly. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, but my mom believed in me. Mm -hmm. I love it. How did you leverage this incredible, amazing moment on America's Got Talent to get to whatever was next? I did it. And that was... That's why I say, like, bro, I took so many L's. Like, I never was able to capitalize, right? We always had these big moments because I, I never signed to a label. My mama didn't want to do that. She was like, mm -mm, not yet. Like, you a child. Like, have fun with it, right? But we never got to capitalize. Like, off of, I should have been making millions of dollars. <laughs> I'm not even going to lie. Like, I should have been making millions of dollars since the age of 14. Like, millions of dollars just capitalizing off merch capitalizing off social media but we didn't know and you sometimes you just don't know what you don't know 
And so uh, we, 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 we kind of dropped the ball and that's why I got into basketball though, right? Because music has slowed down. You know how music do. You up, you down. Because at that point I was getting booked for shows. I'm probably getting like 5,000 here, 10,000 here. I'm paying the bills. Like we're good. Like, you know what I'm saying? Me and my mom, we thugging it out. <laughs> She's still not working, but we getting into it. And then, you know, we hit a slow slump. And I was like, oh no. I told my mama like, mom, okay, like this, I, I can't like, this music is too unpredictable. Like I, I like making music, like it's cool, but like, let me play basketball. Cause I was still playing basketball while I was filming America's Got Talent, filming the rap game, all of that. She said, you're not gonna quit. Like I don't put, we don't put too much into this. I don't put too much into this. Like you're gonna do both. It's the best thing she could have ever said. Like, cause that like, that's the separator for me. And I feel like in everybody else and whatever I do, I feel like I'm the anomaly because of that. And she said, we're going to do both. And man, mm -hmm. that, that, that's crazy. I didn't even think of it like that. But me not really taking advantage of the America's Got Talent opportunity and going to the biggest heights that I could have led me to basketball. Mm -hmm. And boy, when I was playing basketball, I started training every day. I did four workouts a day for about two years. Um, cause I had so much catching up to do. You got to think these kids been training since seventh, eighth grade. And I'm just now getting on the, the, the scene at, in the ninth grade, tenth grade. So I had to work my ass off. Finally got ranked. And I ended up being ranked, what, 56 in the country. I was like, oh no, mm -mm, man, I've never been 56 at anything. Okay. That ain't gonna work. Started going crazy. I knew that I wanted to be a McDonald's all American. I felt like that was the peak of high school. I did more than that. I became a McDonald's All-American. I went to the Jordan Classic. I got invited to the Michael Jordan Classic. I won MVP of that. I got invited to the Slam Summer Classic. I won MVP of that. And you got to realize at this point, I'm ranked number 50 in the country. Mm. I'm going against the number one, number two, number three players in the country at these events. And I'm coming out MVP. Like what? Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it let me know that I was on the right track. After that, in high school, I was still dropping music. I, I signed my deal with Rock Nation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which was, it, it, was a, it was a deal, it was a distribution deal. I get to own my masters, creative control. You know, they helping me build my label. So now, now I have a full functioning label that I run and I'm partnered with Rock Nation. But, you know, before it was just a distribution deal. And, uh, and everything was just falling into place. So like I said, I was a McDonald's American, got my jersey retired at my school while I was still at school, um, broke the all-time scoring records at my school, did, did everything. Um, but that, you know, America's Got Talent just kind of segued me into basketball. So your rap career, it's doing this thing with Rock Nation, you're crushing the game on the court. Yeah. How are you balancing those two things at the same time? Yeah, balancing both. For me, it was hard at first, right? Cause it was either I was going so hard at basketball or I wasn't, or I was going so hard at music or I wasn't, or I was going so hard at school. I was gonna say you had school too, yeah. right? Yeah. And I did not and I learned, and I, and I learned, I figured it out my senior year of high school, which I'm just so upset about. But uh, I figured it out in my senior year of high school, right? Um. And I figured out what time management was. Mm. Once I figured that, killed the game. Mm. I figured, and I don't know why I didn't understand it. I was like, damn, I got like 24 hours in this whole day. That's a lot of time. And I started just breaking down my time in the best way that I knew how, right? And so I would say, okay, well, the only, reason, the only way you're going to get all this stuff done is you wake up at like 5 a.m. And I'm just telling myself that. And then I really started waking up at 5 a.m. I was in high school doing this. My mom brought me a car in my sweet 16s. I drove that car. I got a million miles on it. I was just going to practice, driving an hour away, 5 a.m. I get to practice at 6, train, go back 7 o'clock. I go do strength training. Boom, I got school. I go get shots up before school. Boom, I'm done with school. We got team practice. After team practice, I'm going to training. After training, I'm going to the studio. I wake up and do the same thing over and over and over mm. again. And I have one off day, and that day is dedicated to school, right? So that'll be the day I do all my homework, get all my quizzes done. I don't touch a basketball. I don't listen or try not to write a lyric. That's just, you know, that's what I did. So I had to just come up with a schedule that mm. fit me, right? So I was doing that schedule and then I kind of realized like I kind of been doing this kind of all my life, right? It was, I was just never intentional about it. So I think I just came, became intentional about my schedule and just not letting nothing overwhelm me. And I think like, cause you know, 20 things you're looking at is like, whoa, I just got real good at scheduling, time management, discipline, consistency. 
because I never was consistent and I was a procrastinator and I hated it. So I just kind of had to change some things and kind of just grow up mentally. I think those are the things when you start reading books and you start, you know, seeing different things, you start learning stuff like that. Can you tell me about the power of consistency in your life? You said it's something I never did before. I learned it. Can you talk to me about the power what? of consistency? I mean, you, like my life would be nothing without consistency, without consistently showing up and trying to be a better version of myself. You know, people are like, you know, even when you don't want to do it, you got to do it like you love it. That's the realest thing ever. I'm not I'm not a believer in just showing up and just getting it done. I feel like that just wasted my time. And I'm going, I'm going to give 100,000% like every rep, every time. Um, and so I fell in love with the art of mastering consistency because I feel like you can never really master consistency. It's just something that you can try to just reach, right? But I just wrote it on my mirror every morning, discipline and consistency, discipline and consistency. I would make Instagram pages and it was, I got one, it's called discipline and consistency mm -hmm. and I post every day just to hold myself accountable. Like, you know what I'm saying? And once I figured that out, game changer, consistency, game changer, discipline, the biggest books started reading crazy amount of books um i mean i, I read a lot of self-help books type mm -hmm. like that like my favorite book is the alchemist like the four i love agreement. the alchemist i read like four times yes yeah, same i give it to people i'm like <laughs> read this like, you need to read this right um atomic habits i'm, I'm reading um a lot of different books yeah. but they taught me those things right and I, and once I fell in love with that in high school, it was the best. That's why I'm, I'm going to tell you later. But, okay. Yeah. Um, they, one of my favorite quotes is, uh, discipline is the greatest form of self-love, right? I and love so, that. Yeah. I have that in my phone. It is, right? Because it's like, you, that discipline is like, like, it's like, it's like loving your future self more, right? Like, do I love myself enough? to do this. It's like self-care. Mm, uh, I 100%. love that. I think I heard Will Smith said that and I took it and ran with it. I love that. It's true. All right. So now I'm going to move you into college. So you're doing the rap thing. You're doing the basketball thing. You end up at LSU. Why LSU? I chose LSU because I wanted to first start. When I committed to LSU, I was the only McDonald All-American that came under Coach Mokey and you know, it, it was nobody there. And I felt like that was perfect for me, right? I was like, I want to come. Yeah, I want to come. I want to start. Like, I, I don't want to go to a team where it's already stacked and I won't play. <laughs> Absolutely not. I'm not doing that. So she had already, because she was at Baylor. And I was like, damn, I, I want to play for her. Like, I seen her on, um, on the, my first time watching the Final Four during COVID. <laughs> She was tripping on the sideline. I'm talking about going crazy, screaming, yelling. And I was like, yep, that's who I need to play for. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's who I need to play for. And so she, when she moved to LSU, I felt like it was perfect. It was a new beginning for her, a new beginning for me. And she was one of the only coaches that told me, Fla, do both. You know, I support you 100 percent. You can rap. She said you could be an astronaut as long as you land up at space and be back to practice at 130. I don't care what you do. Like, you know what I'm saying? And she just gave, gave me that confidence of like, as long as you take care of your business on the court and in the classroom, I'm with it. Mm -hmm. She actually took me to the studio on my official visit. So it just showed how much she poured into me and cared. And yeah, it went from there. And, you know, I ended up going in there. We won the national championship. Yeah, what was that like? I won SEC freshman of the year. It was amazing. Mm. It was everything that I prayed for. I literally had, a, I wrote, I took a picture of a board that I wrote before the championship. I had this year, I want to win a championship. I want to win freshman of the year, defensive player of the year. Woo, woo, woo. And, you know, I accomplished two of those goals, which was crazy. It was like, it was crazy. Yeah. One thing I'm learning about you is you're like a master manifester, right? Speaking it into existence, yes. writing it down, playing and then going down yes. and, and making it happen. Um, as you graduate from LSU, you have a, ma a major focus now on your music career. Yeah. Let's talk about your music career. What's going on there? Well, music career is amazing. <laughs> um, I feel like I'm finally making music that I love but that everybody can relate to as well. Like, you know, man, I get DMs and people telling me like, your music has helped me through so much. Like, you know, my grandma died and when I listen to your music, it kind of just give me life. And that's what I'm talking about when I say life changing stuff. Like, that's gonna penetrate like mm -hmm. through the soul. And I just think that's the most important gift that I have with the music is that I can touch people. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. so many people out there who are making music to fit what already exists. What do you have to say to people 
um, who aren't yet willing to follow your journey, which is to make music that you love and then find an yeah. audience. Yeah, no, I think, you know, trying to make music that fits kind of the dumbest thing ever. I hate when I go meet with a label. That's why I have no, I'm saying that's why I ain't really signed with a label. Because you go there and they try to tell you what to make. They try to tell you how to dress. They try to tell you how to look. No, mm. you know what I mean? And and, and I'm, I'm a big believer in standing firm on that and creating music that feed my soul. Mm. Like if the music don't make me feel good, I don't want to drop it. Like, and I don't want to make it and I won't make it and I won't and I won't put it out. But, you know, I just I like music that feed my soul because I know it's going to I know somebody else is going to, mm. you know, you know, feel it, too. And that's just all it's about. Just giving that energy like it's all about energy. I would be I would be remiss if before we get out of here we don't you know you're you're rocking this beautiful hoodie. Yes. You recently just dropped a new album. Let's yes. talk about the album. Oh, this okay. It's not an album. You know, people keep saying album. I'm gonna let them run with it, but it's an EP. EP. It's an mm -hmm. EP. Um, but it sounds like an album, so I'll take it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but no, this this album is everything to me, right? Because I never wanted to be a gimmick. I never wanted people like, oh, that's the basketball player girl. She rap, 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 rap. No, no, that's never what I wanted to be. I didn't. I wanted people to take me serious, like. And I feel like I had that stamp of approval when we went to Natty, because people were like, oh no, she could hoop for real, mm -hmm. right? But the music was never on that same level, right? Even though people knew me from America's Got Talent and they knew me from the rap game and they knew me from all these places, they never kind of put it together like, oh, that's the girl. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I was like, bro, we need a splash. Mm -hmm. After the national championship, Sue Bird and Lil Wayne are on ESPN, and Sue Bird tells Lil Wayne, damn Lil Wayne, when you gonna work with Flaje? <laughs> Why she do that? <laughs> <laughs> Why she do that? Through the alley you right to me, bro. I posted on my Instagram, I'm like, oh yeah, Flaje, Lil Wayne coming soon. Like, I don't even know. I ain't talked to Wayne yet, but I'm like, you That's just said that on ESPN. It's <laughs> up. <laughs> Man, it took like a year. You know, he I sent him the verse, he sent it back, and Probably, like, probably not a year, probably like a couple months. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's Lil Wayne, like, you know, just, the ghost, just no. let him do his thing, yeah, right? Yeah. Give me, you know, and he blessed me. Mm -hmm. Like, you know how much a Lil Wayne feature costs? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. people like, like, he blessed me. Like, mm -hmm. it's a blessing. Like, I've never, I've, like, in, in the game, like, I've never paid for a feature. Mm -hmm. I got a feature with NLE Choppa, um, Too Rare, and Lil Wayne. Like, them, I think, and Roy Woods, shout out Roy. But like, I've never played, paid for a feature and I probably never will. Like, I want to create music with people who want to create, wanna music, create with music with me, right? And I've done been trying to reach out to rappers and I, like, early in my career and even now, like, even like, not now, now, but like, a couple months ago, I was like, now, like, we need these people for the project, right? I'm like, bro, I'm not going to make music with nobody. If, like, I'm not just going to try to do that. Like, that's lame. Like, mm -hmm. I need to make music with people I have genuine connection with. And I'm standing on that still. Like, even as I get older and, and and I become a bigger artist or whatever. I'm not gonna just work with anybody. Like I'm gonna work with my friends. So, you know, but you know, all of that was off the love, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like now, I'm like, how am I gonna top this? Like I got Wayne on my first EP. It's not even the album. How am I gonna top this? You know what I mean? But it's a special moment for me. Yeah, the absolutely. album cover is amazing. I actually, um, my dad's face is even like in the okay. album cover. I don't know if you can see it right now, okay. but you'll see it. We'll take. And it's just a sure tribute. This project for me was like, stop playing with me. You know what I'm saying? Like, let me in. Like, I'm one of them. Like, and, and Essence dropped this cover for my, for my project and it said, best new music that dropped. And it said, Megan Thee Stallion, mm. Flage, and Lotto. Right? That's and good company. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, look, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, it just good. gives me so much motivation and more ambition just to go and chase my goals. and. Just to be up there with those artists, right? And I'm being myself. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm creating my own path, my own wave. It's beautiful. Yeah. And so I'm super excited about this album. It's gonna I'm EP, look, y'all got me saying I'm super excited about this project. It's gonna be one to remember for sure. Master Manifester, what should the world expect from you next? Man. What are you manifesting next? What's coming? I'm manifesting building my businesses, uh, my beauty brands. Um I'm manifesting, um, we're working on building a resource center in the city of Savannah. What's a resource center? What does that mean? Okay, let me, let me break it down to you. You remember when I told you that like the Boys and Girls Club was the place for me where I found myself? I want to build that mm -hmm. uh, and honor my father's legacy as well. The building that he was murdered in front of um, is still there. And it, it, it was his studio, which is crazy. And it was acquired by the, the, mayor, the, the city of Savannah. 
And, you know, we fought so hard for years to get that building and now it's finally in the works. And, you know, we're working with investors to really get this building started and it's going to be a resource center and a place for kids to go and to be able to get away from the, the, the crime and the violence in Savannah, Georgia. It's, I mean, it's terrible. And I think it's going to be a place where, you know, the dreamers can go. And I believe that it's my duty to change a life and change a perspective and change a mind in Savannah, Georgia, because not everybody comes from where I come from. Not everybody got a mother that I have and they're going to be able to have the opportunity to change their perspective. Because I keep telling you, it's all perspective. 100%. And so all I want to do is just trying to give them that inspiration and building this resource center. I'm partnering with a lot of different people to, to really make it as dope as possible. And it's one of my biggest accomplishments. I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I know Thank we got to go. I hope you'll come back one day. I feel back. like we have a whole lot more we yeah, can we talk do. about. We do. Uh, but before we get out of here, my last question for you is anything that you want to say to the audience? Any words of advice, wisdom? Yes. Um, my favorite quote, I want to tell y'all, um, she who says she can and she who says she can't are both usually right. And I think that that quote right there is just something that I live by. Like anything is possible. You can accomplish anything with consistence, and discipline and belief in yourself. And just like, no, you don't have you don't need anybody to believe in you. I know it's hard to think that and it is. But if you have a dream and you're passionate about it and you believe in it, you have to hold on to it and tell yourself that you can do it because you can't. That's like my biggest piece of advice. Oh, also like just be kind to other people. Mic drop. Queen, I appreciate you. I'm honored, humbled to have you here. Look forward to seeing you next time. Thank, Thank you. you for coming to the Black Print. Thank you for having me. It was an honor. Flauge, chart topping artist, national championship winner. So many gems and so much wisdom that she dropped. One of my favorite things that she talked about was the importance of her support system. It's so clear that Flauge wouldn't be the woman that she is today without her mother, without her boys and girls club, without her coaches. It reminds me of an African proverb that goes, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. No matter where you are in your life, no matter what you're trying to do, find that tribe. Your support system is critical to your ability to progress and move forward. Another lesson that I think we get from Flauge's story, um, both in what she talked about and literally just you would watch her do it while she was speaking, is this importance of perspective. This is a young woman who has dealt with pain. She has dealt with tragedy. She's dealt with so much negativity, but you would never know that because every single time she flipped that pain into positivity. She flipped that tragedy into triumph. And so we have to remember that life is not always going to be good, but what matters most is not what happens to you, but how we frame that story, how we frame that narrative and the perspective that we bring to it. And the last thing that I think is so evident in her story is that Flauge is a master manifester. She is so good at speaking everything that she wants into existence. And not only is she doing it by speaking life into existence, but she is then following it up with consistency and with dedication. And so she's saying it to herself in affirmations, she's writing it on her mirrors, but then she's going to put in the work to make sure that it happens. I think that if we take all three of those things, speak it into existence, be consistent about what we wanna be doing, and be disciplined in all of it, then we all have the ability to reach and attain the dreams that are inside of us.